Hey guys, welcome to Fast Keto. I'm your host, Keto Jenny Girl. Hey guys, happy Friday. I am so pumped about today's episode. I had the extreme privilege of having Dr. Benjamin Beekman joining us today. And we talked all about the interesting relationship between fat burning, insulin, glucagon, and all things fat and protein, including getting into brown fat a little bit and how it's activated. But we mostly spoke about protein and the importance of prioritizing protein. Dr. Beekman has done some amazing work and research in this field. He earned his PhD in bioenergetics and was a postdoctoral fellow with the Duke National University of Singapore in metabolic disorders. His professional focus currently is as a scientist and professor at Brigham Young University and it's all about better understanding chronic modern day diseases with a special emphasis on the origins and consequences of metabolic disorder including obesity and diabetes. So he focuses his whole career on understanding metabolic health and he frequently publishes his research in peer-reviewed journals and presents at international meetings and conferences around the world and I think his work is so important and critical to the protein dialogue to the health dialogue and his contributions to low-carb and ketogenic research are phenomenal. I'm so thankful that there are people out there like Dr. Beekman who are doing this kind of extremely exciting and valuable research and it was so fascinating having him join us on the podcast podcast today. We got into so many interesting topics. So without further ado, here is today's episode. I hope that you enjoy it and be sure to let me know how you found it over on Instagram. I love hearing from you guys and it's so fun to hear what you thought of the episode and I'm sure Dr. Beekman would love to hear from you as well. So enjoy the show. And this episode is brought to you by Ketogenic Girl. If you haven't checked out my cookbook yet, it's called Keto Essentials on Amazon. It has a hundred 50 of my most favorite delicious nourishing keto recipes as well as a ton of information on how to get into ketosis testing yourself or not testing yourself how to interpret results how to maintain a ketogenic lifestyle and most of all how to avoid all of the mistakes that I made when I first went keto and that I've learned with working with over 3,000 people so far to get into nutritional ketosis so check out keto essentials on Amazon and I hope you guys enjoy this episode a few disclaimers. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice as I am not a qualified healthcare provider. The information presented on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Ketogenic Girl is not qualified to provide medical advice. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to this podcast. Prior to beginning a ketogenic diet, you should undergo a full health screening with your physician to confirm that a keto diet is suitable for you and to rule out any conditions or contraindications that may pose risks or that are incompatible with a ketogenic diet. A keto diet may or may not be appropriate for you if you have any kind of health condition, whether known to you or unknown. So you must consult your physician to find this out. Anyone under the age of 18 should consult with their physician and their parents or legal guardian. All right. Well, Ben, thank you so much for joining us here today on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for the invitation, Vanessa. I'm delighted. Yeah. So for anyone who may not be familiar with you or your work, could you give us a little bit of background? Yeah. I am an academic scientist and professor. So I teach a class, but most of my time at the university is spent doing research with, of course, a metabolic focus. And that started my roots academically are exercise science. And then that started shifting me into more just pure physiology more just the study of the body. And then that was the next step was studying obesity. And then that has got me to where I am now, which is studying insulin and insulin resistance in particular, with a more recent focus on ketones, specifically as molecules and how ketones affect the cells of our bodies. You have some really fascinating research that I've been following. I'm curious what first made you interested in all of this. Yeah, it's the very beginning of it was as a young master's student, my my first graduate degree, I found that fat tissue made and released pro-inflammatory proteins. So that was the beginning of me learning that fat tissue was an endocrine organ. 
or a gland that would mm-hmm. release hormones into the blood. And that was the beginning. That's where I said, okay, I have to learn more about what fat tissue is doing. And then the fact that the fat tissue was releasing pro-inflammatory proteins uh, and then causing inflammation in the body, that was then what got me into insulin resistance. And so it all began with that one paper published in the early 2000s that fat tissue is an endocrine organ. I was just fascinated by that. That is really fascinating. I wasn't aware that fat released hormones or that it was an endocrine organ. And I mean, I find hormones so fascinating because it's your body communicating with itself. Yeah. It's an internal communication. So that is really, really fascinating. Yeah, it's it was. In fact, now we've come to find out that essentially every organ makes hormones. Like muscle makes its own hormones and releases them. Bones make hormones and you know everything, the kidney, you name it. Uh, and fat was just another one of those many glands and, and releasing pro-inflammatory hormones to, to boot. So it was pretty fascinating at the time and still. Right. I mean, it makes sense that those adipocytes or fat cells would have their own things to say (laughs) as well in the body. Yeah, Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's interesting that they are releasing pro-inflammatory proteins. That would be, I would find that pretty striking as well. And, And it contributes to the, I guess, the investigation of inflammation in the body and where it's coming from and why. Right. Yeah. And not all fat makes the same degree of pro-inflammatory proteins in particular, and this wouldn't be surprising, visceral fat or the fat that we have, of course, more centrally in in the body surrounding our internal organs makes these pro-inflammatory hormones much more readily than subcutaneous fat or the fat that is just beneath the skin that we can pinch and jiggle. And so I always joke with my students that even though we don't like it, if it jiggles, it's good. So if, if we have, if we're a heavier person with more body fat, And it's the fat that's all just right beneath our skin. As unattractive as we may think it is, it is actually, of course, far better for health than having a big belly, but it's really hard. You know, if someone has a big round belly and you you can't really jiggle it because it's underneath all the muscle, that's much worse. Right. And so there's, I guess there's three, not types of fat, but places that the body will store it. That's just under the skin, the subcutaneous, you're saying visceral, really around the organs. And then there's ectopic fat. Are those the three kinds? Yeah, good. That's a good way to put it. Um, But ectopic would generally be lumped under the visceral, typically, because where we're storing it. So ectopic is anytime we're storing fat, not in fat cells. And and so ectopic, ectopic meaning it's not where it belongs. And you, overwhelmingly, that's in other tissues, like your, especially, say, the, the liver, you know, which is in that visceral space as well. But nevertheless, ectopic could apply to you're storing too much fat in muscle. So ectopic mm-hmm. would, is normally lumped under visceral, but it doesn't have to be. Right. Now, you've also differentiated between different types of fat or adipose tissue between brown fat yeah. and non-brown fat or white fat. I first started hearing about that maybe five or six years ago, and then I read somewhere that it was a myth. So I'd be really, really interested to understand more about it from your perspective. Oh, yeah, yeah. So another way of classifying fat, in addition to classifying it by location, which we just did, which was visceral versus sub- mm-hmm. another way of classifying it is by metabolic activity or metabolic rate, simply put, and that would be white fat versus brown fat. And it does, in fact, look different to the eye. And it is absolutely not a myth. I can say that with absolute authority. It is not a myth. Humans have brown adipose tissue. And in fact, we have quite a bit of it when we're born, which is why babies usually won't shiver. You know, I've always been fascinated with my own little babies. <laughs> the, they come out of the bathtub and, and they aren't shivering. Um, they're just these little chubby balls of, of heat. And it's because babies, <laughs> babies have a lot of brown adipose tissue or brown fat. And, and, and as we grow up, we start to lose some of that. But we always have it. Everyone has some. And the brown fat is very metabolically active. But it's, a, it's an interesting metabolic activity. Because the muscle cells, for example, our muscles have a tremendous metabolic activity. And that's because we have them work. They move our bodies around. The muscle cells are breaking down nutrients like glucose and fatty acids, and then it's turning them into a usable energy for the muscle cell to work, to move, to contract and relax. But in the case of the brown adipose 
cells, they aren't working. They're not contracting or relaxing. They're not moving the body around. They're just sitting there. They're quite inert. But what they're doing, the brown fat is taking in glucose in particular, and then it's burning the glucose just to create heat. It's not trying to get any work done for the body to move the body or to work like the liver does or work like the brain does. It's just creating heat. And in a way, that is waste of energy, you know, where normally the brain, for example, is only using glucose or ketones in as much as it needs to get chemical energy, like uh, what's called ATP, this molecule that helps the mm-hmm. cell get, get other things done. But in the case of the fat cell, it's just or the brown fat cells. They're just using glucose for no functional purpose. There's no work getting done. It's just wasting the energy as heat. And so it is, you know, if if you're cold exposed, we know that when people get exposed to cold around 18 Celsius an hour a day or something like that, their brown fat gets activated. And that that matters because, and and that's the way the, the brown fat's trying to keep the body warm. There's this kind of area where 18 Celsius around there, depending a little bit on the person, of course, that's where the body will be trying to warm itself, but not through shivering. And of course, when you start to shiver, then it's not the brown fat warming you, although it can certainly still do that. But then it's your muscles that are warming you. The muscles are you know, twitching, and, and that's starting to create just some heat as they're working a little bit. But the brown fat will start to warm the body. It'll be activated. And when it is activated, it uses as much glucose as muscle does. And so its metabolic rate starts to be comparable to muscle, which is pretty substantial. That is substantial. Now, going back to location, is it mostly located in any specific areas or subcutaneously or visceral fat, or is it everywhere? Yep, yep, that's a good question. No, it's very much located up in the thoracic and clavicular area, so at the bottom of the neck and in the upper portions of the rib cage. So not very obvious spots. You wouldn't look at someone and see a bulge in their neck and say, "Wow, you've got some really big brown fat." You know, that would never happen. <laughs> um, these are these are very these are very subtle areas. There is not much in people, but we know that we can activate them. We know that when people have more, and that the brown fat is more regularly activated, they are more resistant to obesity and insulin resistance. But what's so relevant about brown fat is that our subcutaneous fat can become more brown-like. It has the ability to kind of shift its profile and start acting more like the brown fat. And what that means, brown fat, the reason it's brown to the eye when we look at a piece of it, it is brown. It's brown because it has so much more mitochondria in it. The, the portion, mm. the part of the cell that, that uses energy and, and makes right. energy for the, for the cell. So it is enriched with mitochondria. And so it gives it a very different color. And what we see is that the white subcutaneous fat cells can begin to have more mitochondria that are acting like the mitochondria from brown fat. And, and of course, that then represents a tremendous potential pool of brown fat. If you can start to recruit your subcutaneous fat, which is what most of our fat is in most people, now you've suddenly got quite a bit of this kind of poser or fake brown fat, but it wants to act like it. That's really, really interesting. So what happens if you're on a low carb or ketogenic diet and you are restricting glucose to the brown fat cells? So that wouldn't happen. Vanessa, that's a good question. Going low carb does not mean we start feeding brown fat differently than before. Brown fat has a preference for glucose as a fuel, and it's going to use the glucose for the fuel. I know of no evidence to suggest that its glucose use goes down. Now, what that means, of course, so as brown fat is active, let's say, because ketones start to turn that subcutaneous fat, this is what we're studying now, where we we see that ketones are making the subcutaneous fat start to act more like brown fat. And so this would be a way of someone potentially hijacking this effect that normally only happens with cold, but doing it just because ketones are elevated. The the ketones, as they go up, they are promoting the activation of the white fat to start acting more like brown fat. And then the, the brown fat would start using more glucose. And that would mean just simply the liver starts making a little more glucose to feed the brown fat. 
Interesting. So what is your take on a ketogenic diet since that's what brought us here to chat today? Are you following a ketogenic lifestyle yourself? I am. Yeah. Now I'm a dad of young kids, which means that it's, there are sometimes some lifestyle complications that I have to deal with. Like when I take my 11 year old daughter out on a daddy daughter date and she wants to go get ice cream. I'm not going to sit there and just watch my daughter awkwardly eat her ice cream. You know, for example, you know, so, so there are just some, you know what I mean? I don't want that to be her memory. You're going to be a good dad. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I kind of, I'm a, I don't know what, I don't know what I am, but I'm, I'm a pretty practical low carb ketogenic guy just because, you know, if, if, if like the dinner that night isn't quite as low carb as I'd want it to be, I'll certainly make efforts on my own to, to make some slight adjustments, but I'm not going to not eat dinner with my family. So for me, I'm a husband and father um, before anything else. I don't want my diet mm -hmm. to get in the way of that. But having said that, one of the reasons I am an advocate of a low-carb diet is because I want to be a very healthy father and I want to be a very healthy grandfather in 10 or 15 years. Um, it's very important to me to, to be healthy and to maintain my health. And so that is why I do it. So it may be inconvenient sometimes, but I, I do my best to stick with it. And I got my personal conviction of a low carb diet didn't come because of me wanting to um, be in ketosis. Although I appreciate that more and more, I came to it because I wanted to control my insulin. As a scientist, I just was becoming more and more convinced that there is a, a, a better way to eat than we have been. And that, of course, was the focus on starches and then generally being afraid or shunning fat, especially saturated fat. And, and when I started looking at the human clinical data, what had been published in human studies, that's when it all fell apart. When I realized, wow, this, this typical story we've been saying for decades simply doesn't work. And to rephrase it, my embracing a low-carb diet, even to the point of ketogenesis, was because of my determination to control my insulin for all of the benefits that come with that. Whether it's I wanted to maintain a lower body weight, I wanted to keep my brain clean of plaques to avoid Alzheimer's disease, I wanted to keep my blood vessels clean and avoid atherosclerosis. There are countless benefits uh, to controlling mm -hmm. insulin. In fact, it, it's all of the chronic diseases, essentially. Right. They all seem to have their roots either in your metabolic health or in inflammation, which is now being used more and more as a marker for disease. Right. Yeah. And I would even say the inflammation still comes back through metabolic health. And that was the point of all of my fellowship work that I did before I became a professor. It was looking at how inflammation causes insulin resistance, which it does very, very well. And so even then, to me, all of the chronic diseases uh, that I've seen, and I, I don't say to me, I have evidence, there are studies to support this. So there is evidence to suggest that every non-infectious chronic disease has some connection to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is either directly causing it, like in the case of infertility, of polycystic ovarian syndrome, or in most cases of hypertension, or the insulin resistance is making it worse like in the case of, say, prostate or breast cancer. The insulin resistance didn't cause it, but it's driving the tumor growth. I, I really couldn't agree with you more. And I almost find that sometimes it's almost ridiculous how many diseases are connected back to insulin resistance to the point where, like, my husband will roll his eyes. I'm like, they just cured three cases of schizophrenia, you know, with keto, or yeah. they just cured Parkinson's or MS with keto. And he's like, come on, like, you really can't do this much. Like, and I feel I sound silly when I'm explaining it and talking about it, but it, it is almost like you almost can't believe how many conditions really just all go back to the same root cause. Yeah. In fact, I love that you just mentioned some neurological pathologies or disorders. So you, in fact, you've almost sort of shifted this a little bit, but it's just worth mentioning for a second. So many types of neurological disorders are known to be caused by what's called glucose hypometabolism. In, in fact, indeed, in each of the disorders you just mentioned, not that it would be the cause of every, every instance of Parkinson's, or every instance of a bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, mm -hmm. but some of them, some 
types of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, migraines, depression, even autism. And again, autism, this may right? sound controversial, but there are studies to back this up. It's, it's thought to be caused by an inability of the brain to meet all of its energetic needs through glucose alone. So, right, it's- yeah, so, so the brain, it's basically saying, hey, I need this much energy. And 100% energy is what I need, of course. And glucose, I can't use glucose very well anymore. Kid, that in some instances, especially Alzheimer's disease, it's very likely because the brain has become insulin resistant. And so it's simply not moving the glucose in to use as readily as it was before. But regardless, it simply can't meet all of its energetic needs from glucose alone. And then the only other option for the brain is ketones. Mm-hmm. The great tragedy is most people will never have any ketones. They are eating so much starch and they're eating so frequently that their ketones will never go up. They'll never rise enough to feed the brain. And so the brain never gets that alternative fuel that it's so desperately seeking to try to return to normal function. But that's why, like what you're saying, in, in many of these neurological disorders, when you do provide the brain this alternative fuel, allow it to work like a hybrid engine and, and switch fuels. Now, all of a sudden, you start to solve some of the problem, maybe not 100%, depending on the problem. But in many types of migraine headaches, for example, we know that in some instances, it's caused by glucose hypometabolism. And the person with these migraines, if they get into ketosis, they will never have another one. And this has been published since the 1920s, for heaven's sakes. We've known that if you put someone in ketosis, their migraines essentially go away. It is amazing. I love that you explained it so well because I have read that diabetes or Alzheimer's is also being called diabetes type 3. Like it's a diabetes of the brain, which I think helps in understanding as well that it is similarly, like you were saying, a metabolically rooted yep. you know, uh, condition. And I wonder if that could be applied to some other neurological conditions. Obviously, like you're saying, not everything can be cured with a ketogenic diet, but the effects that it is having are really astounding and definitely worth, you know, more research. And I'm so thankful to people like you who are, you know, spending your valuable time in doing this kind of research, because it is the most exciting field to me, potentially, that could be studied at the moment. It is. It's, it's what's so exciting about it is when, when someone learns that they don't need to be yoked to a handful of pills that they have to take for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. That to me is the most powerful message that their lifestyle could be part of what got them there and their lifestyle can be part of getting them away from that illness. Exactly. Now in layman's terms, could you just explain insulin and glucagon and how they're connected back to metabolic health? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So when it comes to metabolism in the body. This may sound sort of superlative and I'm being extreme, but 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 I'm not. Insulin really just controls metabolic function. If insulin is up, the body is storing energy. And if insulin is down, the body is using its energy. And, and so in other words, another way of saying that if, if if insulin is up, fat cells are getting big and we're making more of them. If insulin is down, fat cells are shrinking because it is the fat cells are now sharing the fat that they've been storing. There's just really no other way to put it. And, and this has other ramifications too, where insulin can tell other cells to grow. But And, and so insulin activates anabolic pathways all over. And anabolism is the part of metabolism that's involved in the growth of a cell. And then if insulin is low, then we have the activation of catabolic pathways or catabolism, which is the breakdown part of metabolism. And that's what glucagon wants to do. So insulin and glucagon represent these interesting contrasts. They're both released from almost the exact same spot of the pancreas, and they have totally contrasting effects. So for example, when insulin wants to lower blood glucose, you know, you eat a meal, blood glucose is now too high. And I do say too high. If it stays, you know, if it were to stay that high after a meal indefinitely, then you have, you could die. Uh, that's when the kidneys start to spill too much of the glucose into the urine and the person's urinating too much and they would die from too low of blood pressure. And so in order to prevent that from happening, insulin will be released. So insulin climbs up. It basically opens the doors of the cells and pushes the glucose from the blood 
into the cells. Glucagon, however, it doesn't do that. Glucagon would rather open the doors of the cells and push all the energy out of the cells. So it's telling the, the liver, hey, you've got a lot of stored glucose, uh, let it go. It's telling the fat cells, you're storing a lot of fat, you need to let that go, let the body use it. And then it's also telling the liver, make ketones and share the ketones with the body too. So glucagon wants to just st do whatever it can to get energy into the blood to be used by the body. One question I'm really, really curious about is typically, what I, from what I've read, you have to create a totally insulin-scarce environment or insulin-scarce state for the body to go into that energy-burning, fat, catabolic state. Does insulin have to be completely at zero? I mean, I don't know if that's possible. Oh, no, no, no. no. No, it's not possible unless you're a type 1 diabetic. But right. that is such a great question, Vanessa. So you're in, let's say you're in ketosis right now, or we're, we're both in ketosis now. That's because our insulin has been sufficiently low, not zero. That's impossible because we're not type 1 diabetics. Right. But our insulin is sufficiently low that the body is simply saying, well, insulin's not high enough to tell me to store energy. Or another way, more, more directly, insulin's not high enough to inhibit ketogenesis. And so normally, if insulin starts to go high uh, above normal fasting levels or basal levels, then it will stop the liver's ability to create ketones. It just immediately pushes the brakes and stops ketogenesis. But it, that does not insulin does not have to be zero to remove the inhibition on ketogenesis. It just has to be low and whatever that may mean for someone. And that would mean different uh, you know, that would be a different level of low for different people, but it's never dangerously low. Insulin simply goes to, it just kind of sits down and waits for its turn. It waits for it, um, it and for a signal to tell it to be released. But you can eat, you could eat zero grams of carbohydrate, not a single speck of carbohydrate. And yet blood glucose levels, as people do this, you know, with the kind of the rise of the keto carnivore as more and more people are doing that. And that's fine. They're not dying from hypoglycemia. Their blood glucose levels are totally normal. And that's because the liver, of course, is making everything they need. And that means there will always be some level of insulin. But if the liver's the one making the glucose mm -hmm. in the blood and putting that into the blood, and it's not coming from the diet, mm -hmm. then insulin has, the insulin has to be low. Because if insulin starts to rise, that will stop the liver's ability to make glucose, or right. it will, insulin will turn off gluconeogenesis. Right, it would impede the gluconeogenesis. Is there anything about deriving all of your glucose via gluconeogenesis that could be counted as a negative, or is getting your glucose via gluconeogenesis just from, say, for example, if you're on a carnivore diet, you're just eating protein, zero carb, and some fat. Is there any detrimental effect to that? No, no, but no, no, uh, not that I know of. I know of no evidence to suggest that's problematic at all. Now, it is worth noting, just to be fully accurate, and you know, there could be someone listening to this and saying, holy smokes, Vanessa and Ben, you got that wrong. <laughs> um, muscle has, you know, trace amounts of, of glucose in it stored as glycogen. Right. Um, so even even when someone's going, you know, carnivore, they're still getting a teeny bit, although it is insubstantial. But just for the sake of accuracy, you know, we have to disclose that there is yes. teeny bits of glycogen in the muscle meat that we eat. But even still, it's not enough to do anything. And so someone who's very low carb to the point of none, their glucose is being made from the liver and there's no evidence. I mean, a lot of people, there's no evidence that's harmful. A lot of people like to think, oh, well, then you're going to wear out your liver. <laughs> and that is just... That's just plain silly. Um, it, it, I don't know how else to say it. I, there's no evidence to suggest that you that you wear out your liver. In fact, if anything, I would say it's keeping your liver clean. Uh, where if insulin is staying low, then you're not having your liver accumulate fat. I mean, the main cause of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, where the liver is getting fat not because of alcohol consumption, it's because of either too much fructose consumed, basically drinking fruit juice, or or too much sugar, or it's because insulin's too high, and that's just making the liver make too much fat, more than the body needs. So I know of nothing negative about telling the liver to do one of its fundamental jobs, right. which is making glucose. That's why we have We're it. We're breaking protein down into amino acids and using it for new tissue generation and also for 
energy to an extent and that's what it's built to do i guess you don't have to be getting yeah but not but don't forget yeah but don't forget it's not just from amino acids although that is certainly part of it um some of it will be much of it will be from glycerol which is this what we always call the backbone of a triglyceride right. when someone's in a low carb state they have triglycerides that are very busily feeding the body yes. and as you're breaking the triglycerides down you're left with that piece of glycerol that just goes right to the liver, makes glucose. And then one other molecule worth mentioning at the risk of really just kind of flipping some heads, <laughs> lactate, where lactate can also um, create, um, can turn into glucose within the liver. And, and lactate would be coming from any busily working muscle. The muscle, ta- uh, the muscle makes the lactate and uh, then the liver takes it in and turns it to glucose. It wasn't. I wasn't aware of lactate at all. I I am aware of the glycerol backbone with triglycerides, and it's. I was always under the impression that we couldn't ne- meet our body's glucose needs just from that glycerol backbone, which is why gluconeogenesis always kind of needs to be happening. Or is that not the case? Well, no, no. In fact, I think, well, I think that's right. Even using glycerol, that is still considered gluconeogenesis. Ah, okay. Anytime we're taking uh, a molecule that is not glucose and we are asking the liver to turn it into glucose, then it's gluconeogenesis. And that is glycerol, that is amino acids, and that is lactate. So there's a gluconeogenesis happening in, during the production of ketone bodies from triglycerides. Right, right. Interesting. Oh, that's really, really interesting. What I love is how you put, because we talked about having an insulin scarce environment, a low insulin environment, but I really like the way that you phrase it as an insulin to glucagon ratio. And in your presentation, you had some great visuals that were showing that ratio on a standard American diet, comparing it to fasted state and also to a low carb or ketogenic diet. And I found it really interesting. So is there an ideal insulin to glucagon ratio in your opinion? Yeah, what a great question. And it would kind of depend on the blood tests that the person uses. And so the insulin to glucagon ratio that I showed in that talk was based on the available tests that they could use to measure insulin and Mm -hmm. glucagon from, you know, around 20 or 30 years ago. And nowadays, someone would simply have to know, they would have to check and and, and know, all right, what are my insulin and glucagon levels in a fasted state from wherever they would get their blood test done. But let's just say that it would be similar to what it used to be, just for the sake of discussion. It, it seems a, a, an insulin to glucagon ratio of around one, you know, a little below or a little above one, that is a pretty ideal range. And I say ideal because one of the benefits of a low carb diet, if you can keep your insulin in control, so low insulin, elevated glucagon, that is good uh, because it continues things like autophagy. It helps keep the cells young in a way. And yet the real benefit then is that you can do that without actually having to starve yourself, mm-hmm. which some, you know, which we do with these multi-day fasts. Mm-hmm. We don't want to call it, we don't want to call it starvation because that doesn't sound very good. But in fact, in a way it, it kind of is. Optional starvation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So sort of self-imposed. Right. Um, but so I think I, I worry sometimes that nowadays Intermittent fasting has become so popular so quickly that I can't help but be a little worried that some people may uh, take it too far. They won't be quite informed enough to know what to be wary of. But nevertheless, um, that's a different topic. But controlling, keeping the insulin to glucagon ratio low, it is a way of getting the benefits of a fasted state and without actually depriving your body of energy. Hey guys, just taking a really quick break to talk about the 28-Day Ketogenic Girl Challenge. If you're interested in doing a ketogenic diet for yourself, it's a great place to start. I teach you everything about how to follow a keto diet to get yourself into nutritional ketosis, and it includes 28 days of meal plans. It comes with weekly shopping lists, how to interpret results, how to test yourself, a complete guide to getting started on keto. If you've 
been keto for a while and you're just not getting the results that you want to in terms of your health or fat loss, or you are brand new to keto, the 20 day challenge is a great option because it also comes with my free coaching and support in our members Facebook group. And you can post any questions that you have about the meal plans about keto. And I am there supporting you. We have an amazing community in our group. I like to call it the happiest place on earth because everybody in there is so excited about following keto, about having found something that really works well for them. And everyone in there is just so kind, caring, generous, and supportive. And it's a really fun place to be and hang out. So if you like more info on it, you can find it at ketogenicgirl.com. And it's the 28-day ketogenic girl challenge. And now back to our interview. Right. I think that's one of the things that we all love so much about a ketogenic diet is that essentially it's a fasting mimicking diet. So you can get so many of the benefits that you can get from long-term extended fasting without having to fast. And one question I would love to ask you is I had read before that autophagy doesn't kick in until three days on an extended fast, but I've recently come across research that it starts as soon as 12 hours in an intermittent fast. So do you have any research on that? You know, I don't know the timeline of it, unfortunately. In fact, uh, what you're saying, though, sounds, I would go more in line with the 12 hours simply because I would say after a meal, you know, let's say uh, in the evening uh, when you're waking up and about to eat again, um, your insulin to glucagon ratio would have gone to fasting conditions. Your liver will be starting to clear, not totally cleared of, of all of its glycogen yet. And, and once you've reached that point where insulin has come down and the liver has used, the body has used the glycogen, mm -hmm. the stored glucose from the liver, that is also the beginning usually of sufficient ketogenesis that the person can then start to detect their ketones. I don't think it's an accident that that time, that kind of 12 hour mm. period aligns so neatly with so many things, activation of autophagy, the liver having emptied and used its glycogen and ketogenesis happening. That's all because it's probably been about that long for the insulin to glucagon ratio to get in line to where it needs to be because it is all dictated by insulin. If someone were fasting for days and I were giving them subtle injections of insulin, um, that would be very dangerous, of course. But if I were giving them, I were giving them insulin injections, they would never get into mm -hmm. ketogenesis, uh, never get into ketosis. That little bumps of insulin would stop that from happening. There would always be that little bit of inhibition of autophagy because insulin, autophagy is when the cell is breaking down parts of itself mm -hmm. to use for energy. So autophagy is a very, is a very catabolic mm -hmm. process, the term I mentioned earlier. And insulin detests catabolism. It does not want the cell to be breaking things down. So insulin is a very strong inhibitor of autophagy. It makes sense that, you know, insulin is one of the most vital hormones in the body. It's so tied to our, you know, imperative, survival imperative. And uh, it makes sense that it would be, you know, not the biggest fan of, of a catabolic processes <laughs> in the yeah, body. That's right. Yeah. But I, I really think that's interesting. Yeah, the body, insulin wants the body to grow. Right. I think it's really interesting because a lot of people believe that, you know, you have to do extended fasting in order to get the benefits of autophagy. But, you know, I know for myself, if I just do 12 hour, 14 hour fast in a day and in intermittent fasting, that I will get, my body will be in such a state of ketosis you know, just from that period of time, which is not all that different from, you know, longer fasting. But I also agree with you that, you know, sometimes the fasting, maybe if it becomes trendy, then people will lose their natural caution with it. And I think of things a lot of times as a pendulum. And I think the benefits, you know, we go from one <laughs> kind of extreme to the other. And we've seen that with keto as well with fat intake. And I think that fasting almost had to swing to this far side in order to show people that it's okay to go an hour without eating something. <laughs> Yeah, and fat right, had to right. go so far to the extreme as well to get rid of people's fear of, of eating it, you know, for, and I'm speaking someone who used to use like the spray fat in the can, you know, to grease a pan because I was so scared of it. And now I'm, I yeah. have no fear of fat. So we have these pendulum swings. And then, you know, thanks to people like you who are being very vocal about some of these aspects, you know, we can 
I'm not saying go back to moderation, but we can find a midpoint where, you know, things we're using some of these, you know, lifestyle hacks and, and health hacks to better our health without having to go to extremes and, and keeping things balanced. I, I agree. Well said. I think that's a, a, a good way to put it. I think on that topic, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about the most was your talk about prioritizing protein. And I think that lines up with this a bit because like you said in your talk, a lot of people fear eating protein and if, and not, I'm not talking about people on a standard American diet, but on a ketogenic diet, you know, the, the approach is really moderating protein and focusing on getting in healthy fats, moderating yeah. protein, and we all know restricting carbs. But I think that there is a fear of eating too much protein. And I want to tell you a little bit about my approach is finding a healthy protein range for yourself, where you're meeting all of your body's daily needs for replenishing protein and body tissue. But you're not eating so much protein that you're picking in gluconeogenesis to the point that you will be in a similar insulin to glucagon, you know, ratio as on a high carb diet. So there is kind of a balance of finding your upper limit. Yeah. And I would say that's a good way to put it. Uh, I would say that if someone is getting protein as, as God intended it, you know, in, in other words, in, in nature, protein comes with fat. I, I'm not sure there is, I'm not sure there's an exception to that. Where if if we're, if someone if 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 a person is eating a natural source of protein, it should be coming with fat. And so I would say, insofar as someone is doing it the way the body was designed, then it will never be a problem. And there's no need to worry about am I getting enough. And basically, if you're eating if you're eating beef, especially, but if if a person's eating meat, they're getting enough protein, and then they're fine. For me, the worry comes when they don't want to eat meat, and so now they're having to get protein from non-animal sources, which is the best source, and then they're taking a lot of shakes. That's going to be problematic. You know, when you're, when you're just getting pure protein, the, that's going to be different in the body, and, and there could be a much more s- substantial insulin effect to that. So, so that and that was part of the reason I talked about that at that meeting um, this earlier this year. It was because I saw people <laughs> eating kind of weird food. In fact, not even food. It was it was that most a lot of people that I knew, not most, several people that I knew um, that were middle aged and older. I saw that they were so determined to stay in ketosis that a lot of their calories in the day right. were coming. Um, from oil, they were just drinking MCT oil in different drinks, and I th- and I could see their aging mm-hmm. bodies and thinking, but where's the protein? You know, and, and they would well, I don't want I don't want to I, I don't want my blood glucose to go up from the protein or my insulin to go up. And I was thinking, man, you guys have they've taken that fear of insulin or mm-hmm. taken their obsession with ketones just too far, and it's okay, it's okay to eat. Um, some protein that may in fact or may not have some effect on your insulin because if insulin isn't ever going up then you'll never have muscle growth it's um, it, you you wouldn't have that those pathways of insulin telling the muscle or even some good growth hormone bumps boy if you're not eating protein you are not going to be having that happen and so if your ketones go down for a, a little while it, hey it's not about the ketones it's about having a healthy and strong body and sometimes, you know, our, our kind of dogged pursuit of ketones uh, can be, uh, well, taken too far and in, in, in doing more harm in the body than good. Right. And I'm curious as to your take on this, because I recently did a carnivore experiment. And I did it because I, I really thought that people who were doing carnivore were, were kind of extreme and a little nuts. <laughs> So I thought, I'm going to try it myself and see what what this is about. And I actually loved it. I really, really loved it. Uh, I got some great 
interesting insights from it, observations. And I love just like the lack of cooking preparation and thought that went into, you know, meal preparation. I really got a lot out of it. And I, I really enjoyed just the zero carb aspect of it. And I had really low inflammation. And it's something that I'm still continuing to kind of explore. I also I'm not shunning vegetables or, or, you know, low sugar fruit or anything in, in terms of like, a healthy ketogenic diet and balance. But the one thing that I did find is that it, it I don't want to have a kind of a bias or mm-hmm. confirmation bias with this, but it did, it did confirm one thing for me. And that is that you can, in some cases, eat too much protein. If you're someone who's like me, who doesn't have tons of lean mass and isn't at the gym working out very regularly. And I've, I found that what was really interesting was two things. First, Going zero carb, Mm -hmm. I was able to eat twice as much protein as usual and still feel as good as energized and be in the similar state of low. My blood sugar was a bit higher. Ketones were a bit lower, but I still felt fantastic. The fact that I could eat double the amount of protein was shocking to me with zero carb. But towards the end... I wanted to still test like how much protein can I actually eat if I can eat double, you know, can I eat triple? I didn't have triple, but I just was Mm -hmm. bumping it up. And so I went up to, I was at about a gram of protein per pound of body weight. And so I was doing about 120 all week. And then I went up to 135 and I woke up the next day and I had fasting blood sugar of 100 and 110, which I haven't seen you know, maybe since early days of keto when I was making a lot of mistakes. And I'm not sounding the alarm on that or anything. And it was just my personal experience. But I'm curious, because it took me about five days of going back to my protein range, which is still a healthy amount, like it's still a very Mm -hmm. healthy amount. It's just not 135 grams. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. In order for my blood sugar fasted to go back to the 70. So I just wanted to test it and say, okay, well, there is an upper limit still. And I'm wondering what your opinion is on that and just how to moderate, how to prioritize protein, how to moderate it sensibly while prioritizing it. You know, do you have a formula for that? Yeah, well, I, I do, and it's not mine. So I need to give credit to a, a very, very good scientist in Canada named Stuart Phillips. He is the muscle protein guy. Mm-hmm. And he's found that there is an optimal range. And, and it's usually, you know, it hovers around, you know, one gram of protein per kilogram body weight. And mm-hmm. so, of course, the, you know, a kilo is roughly, you know, double a pound. Mm-hmm. And so if, for you, you were, um, you were, you know, about doubling what you, you know, were, were needing. Um, right. Uh, basically. Um, and, and so usually if someone is getting around that one gram per kilo, that means they're getting enough protein in their diet to support muscle protein synthesis. So they're not losing yes. muscle. And the reason that it's so important is as we get older, we begin to we just our, our dietary preferences may change in such a way that, or, or let's just take the person who's overweight, the overweight aged individual who starts low carb and they start to see this remarkable weight loss and they start to feel better than they have in decades. What is happening as they're losing all that fat from this fairly low protein diet is that they're also losing lean mass. And that is mass that is not going to come back or it's not going to come back very easily. And so that, that's why they need to, if, they're, if the person, especially this you know, overweight, aged individual, if this person is uh, step number one, controlling their carbohydrates, then, then that's why I kind of make the case that the next step needs to be, am, am, I, am I getting enough protein? And it doesn't have to be that they're counting it. I mean, it really is simply, if I'm eating some, some red meat, then, then they're getting it. I mean, that's almost assuredly going mm-hmm. to be enough. But, but they do need to make sure, uh, am I getting enough protein? And, then, and then, then don't fear any fat. You know, fill all the rest of your calories with fat. And so in your case, you were probably having to either take protein supplements or eat a lot of like lean meat, like chicken, and, and that can, or turkey, and that can go, that I just say, I would say that's just not a, a normal way of eating. 
um, that, that if you had been eating, if you'd been trying to get that much protein from, or yeah, if kind of tracking your protein and getting it from fattier cuts of meat, you would have been so satisfied from that food that you couldn't have eaten that much. I mean, you would just be force feeding yourself to do that to a point of being really uncomfortable. Do you mean that 135 grams? Yeah. It wasn't actually that hard to get to you, probably because I was maintaining like a 65 to 35 ratio of protein to fat. So it was kind of one to one. I It wasn't that hard for me to get there actually. Oh. But and I didn't have to eat a ton of lean protein, but I did have like lots of salmon. I didn't find it was that hard to get there, but I did what I usually advise people and what I do on my program is to find your protein range is to do your body weight times 0.4 and find a lower level and then 0.6 to find kind of a range that you can start experimenting with and then test yourself, test your fasted blood sugar and see where you end up. So it's very it's similar to that one gram of protein per kilogram since that's about half and so you're making sure you're getting an adequate amount of protein and I fully agree with you we shouldn't be fearing protein we should be prioritizing it and I think that on a ketogenic diet you can do that sensibly and and you don't have to eat excessive amounts of fat I always say eat fat to help you with satiety but you don't need to be eating 150, 200 grams of fat per day by any means, you know, to be in ketosis or get high ketones or anything like that. Yeah, that's right. I agree. I think, in fact, everything you said that is, I would say, is prudent and justified in, in evidence. That's a good way of saying it. What's your take on fasting? I know we talked about that a little bit, but... From a scientist's point of view, a lot of people do extended fasting, you know, for the benefits of autophagy, like we discussed. And I'm just curious because there is research that says that the body goes into protein storing mode where it will spike growth hormone after several days in order to preserve your protein. And then you have fat on your body, which most people do have some. Once you've depleted your stored glycogen and then you're turning more to fat, and then you also have that glycerol backbone with the triglycerides. Why would the body catabolize protein tissue if it has so much energy available in the form of stored fat in adipose tissue and also the glycerol backbone? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So there's a couple questions in there. So why, why care about glucose at all if we've got all this fat that we want our body to use? And the, the easy answer to that is that there are some cells that can't use the fat. And now you, I, I could easily say the brain. The brain doesn't use fat for fuel, but it does use that derivative of fat called ketones, which of course go up. And so the brain, in fact, isn't, doesn't really need anything else other than what it's getting. But red blood cells do. Our red blood cells um, have an absolute reliance on glucose. There's no other fuel a red blood cell can use. And so there must be some ability during fasting or a low carb state to create glucose. We need it for, if nothing else, the red blood cells. Um, and then again, the brain can get most, if not all, uh, and I don't know, we don't know if that's true, but we know most, most of the brain's fuel can come from ketones when the body's in ketosis and it works just fine. In fact, arguably better than fine. So th then where does the glucose come from in a fasted state? Some of it will be coming from glycerol, and then some of it will be absolutely coming from muscle amino acids. There's no option where the muscle is the greatest reservoir of protein in the body. It will start to give up out its amino acids, and the liver starts turning those amino acids into glucose. And then, of course, the lactate coming from working muscle, like I said earlier. But even still, if someone is going on a you know a multi-day fast, I, I I just it, to me, it is inconceivable that they can maintain muscle, that they wouldn't be losing muscle. That just is, that is not compatible with the overall environment in a fasted state. The body is, is absolutely demanding that it get sufficient energy to survive. And some of that will absolutely come from muscle. There's no way around it. And so for me, it's the way uh, I, you'd mentioned earlier that regularly going on a 12-hour fast, I mean, 
that should be that should be standard for mm-hmm. everyone every evening they should everyone should have a 12 hour period of not eating but because intermittent fasting has become so popular so quickly i don't use the term and this is just semantics but i don't use the term intermittent fasting to describe that i use the time yeah. restricted eating term where within within a 24 hour window we've simply compressed our eating period to, you know, let's say eight hours or, or whatever it may be and whenever it may be. Yeah. So I don't consider that the same as intermittent fasting. And, and with intermittent fasting, that's kind of the 24 hours or kind of uh, or more. And for me, if, if a person is going over 48 hours, I just start to get a little anxious because I'm thinking to myself, are they ensuring proper hydration, proper consumption of electrolytes? And then my biggest fear, how will they end mm-hmm. their fast? Because if someone ends that multi-day fast um, by, uh, by eating a starchy, sugary meal and insulin goes up dramatically, there are, and this might just sound like I'm beating a drum because I already talked about insulin and I study it so much, but if insulin goes up after this multi-day fast quite quickly and quite high, then it's, it drives potassium, the electrolyte potassium out of the blood and into the cells at such a high rate that the person can experience something called hypokalemia. And, and that's when the potassium gets so low that the cells and nerves can't work anymore and the, and the heart, well, it just stops. And that, that's a genuinely lethal situation called refeeding syndrome that can happen yeah and that can happen i mean this is this is a real thing and so i just i get a little worried sometimes when i hear people kind of bragging about yeah i just finished a four-day fast and i'm thinking oh man Mm -hmm. i hope you were careful uh you can get that muscle back at some day you know um, there are ramifications to just not eating for such an extended period of time some of them may be good you certainly do control insulin, um, but some of them not so good. Right, and there's also phosphorus as well. There's that. There's a big demand on that, and it has to come from your bones. Yeah, that's right. When you go back to to a feeding state, I think with fasting in general, extended fasting for most people, it's probably just something you know to do extremely occasionally and more focus on the time restricted eating and intermittent fasting. Extended fasting, in my opinion, should probably be more focused on extremely obese individuals who are left with no other options or a patient who like um, Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos, they do extended fasting with patients who are, you know, type two diabetes going towards amputations, you know, a lot of situations where that reversal and that fasting is the only option left. And it's the quickest one that's going to prevent those kinds of situations. But that doesn't mean that the general population should all be doing that. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And that's such a great distinction where where Jason has really laid out some very careful, uh, a very careful process um, to do this well. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and so, and I don't, you know, it's, I, I don't have any problem with that. And I know Jason and he's a bright, a very smart guy and, and they have a very good program. And so I don't mm-hmm. ever mean to say there can't be any place for a multi-day fast. I just get a little weary when I see people just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, okay, I'm going to do seven days fast. And I think, oh man, I hope you're doing it well. And I hope you're being smart. That, that's yes. my only concern. What's your opinion on something that's very popular, especially in the bodybuilding world, but I'm curious if it might be a safer option for some people to do a protein sparing modified fast? Yeah, if yes, if you can find a way to, among other concerns, I mean, if you can find a way to mitigate the muscle loss, you're sparing protein um, during a fast, well, then you're, then you've really got something quite powerful there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there would maybe still be some concern with electrolyte handling but if you're sufficiently sparing protein, that would mean insulin. That would probably mean electrolyte balancing is happening just fine as well. And right. so that would be a, a very rational way of doing it. I wanted to ask you about during your presentation, going back to protein and why people shouldn't fear protein. And it was a fascinating study that you presented where you showed the insulin to glucagon ratio in a standard American diet, fasted state, and then on a low carb or ketogenic diet. And what happens when you add protein? 
And the results were really astonishing. Yeah. Right, right. So this was all the more reason why I felt it felt it was important to talk about protein in the in the low carb diet. So many people fear um, protein because they'd say, "Oh, well, it's it's going to be too um, too much gluconeogenesis, and my blood sugars are going to get too high." And I thought that's not the reason to fear protein. In most instances, the reason would be to be wary of the potential effect on insulin because protein can and usually does raise insulin. And yet it all depends on gluconeogenesis. If a person is eating sufficiently low carb, then they need gluconeogenesis to happen. They need the liver to be making glucose just to provide the fuel for the body, any of the cells that need or use glucose. Like I mentioned earlier, red blood cells are a good example. And so if, if someone on a low carb state ate protein and that bumped up their insulin, then they would die from hypoglycemia because you couldn't make glucose anymore. If insulin goes up, you stop making glucose in the liver. And in fact, that was, that was very much reflected in, in, these, in human subjects where they looked at the insulin to glucagon ratio and found that in a low carb state, the insulin to glucagon ratio didn't change. Now, it's important to note that that's a ratio. And so what could have happened is that insulin bumped up a little bit and glucagon bumped up a comparable amount to keep that ratio right where it was before they ever started, before they ever ate the protein in the midst of their low-carb diet. And yet, in contrast, in the standard American-fed, high-sugar, oh, high-starch diet, when they ate protein, there's this substantial increase in insulin and a substantial inhibition of glucagon. And that's because they're eating so much glucose that there's no concern that insulin is going to inhibit gluconeogenesis because it, we don't need it anyway. Right. Mm. And so, and so gluconeogenesis can be inhibited because it wasn't turned on in the first place. And, and, uh, and so insulin goes up dramatically and it's saying, Hey, I have a lot of glucose. I need to store it. I need to put it away somewhere. And then insulin comes up and does that. And so mm. there was a totally different effect um, on insulin and glucagon, but just insulin alone, whether the person was eating a low carb diet or a standard high carb diet. And do you think this could be some of the reason that people fear insulin spikes with consuming protein? Oh yeah, I think, I think so because the textbook description is that insulin will go up dramatically with protein consumption and that is accurate in a high carb fed mm -hmm. person, which is admittedly most people. And so the textbook isn't wrong. It just doesn't tell the other side of the story, which is, well, what happens if a person is avoiding carbs? Well, then, in fact, the insulin effect isn't happening to that degree at all, if it's happening at all. So especially if you are on any kind of low-carb diet, you probably won't see those kinds of insulin spikes in response to your protein consumption. In fact, yeah, that's right. In fact, I would say in your case where you're eating so much more protein than normal, I mean, part of your blood glucose response could be that this was just some period of adaptation. Your body was trying yes. to work towards a new normal. Yes. That's possible. Um, but it's also possible that you are so insulin sensitive and you are so low carb that you weren't getting much of an insulin response but you were still kind of getting this gluconeogenic response from your protein. And so it was your, 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 your blood proteins were going up because the liver was so f on your blood glucose. I mean, the liver was getting so much amino acid that it was just making, and it needs to make gluconeogenesis because you were low carb. So you're making more glucose, but you're not getting the comparable insulin bump that would normally be coming as well. And so it could have been that one side of this effect, the gluconeogenesis, wasn't cut quite matched up with the other side of this, which was the insulin release. And thus your blood glucose levels were a little higher. Right. And that, that makes sense. Yeah. That definitely makes sense. I guess the follow-up question to that, is there a level of protein intake that is not dangerous, but just unhealthy? I don't know because it depends. It so depends on, on people. Um, back to Stuart Phillips research. I think they found that if someone's eating two grams per kilo body weight, then there's no further benefit. And so you've kind of reached the, the level. Right. And even then, it would depend on how much muscle mass does the person actually have as a percent of their body mass and how physically active are they? How often are they, you know, really 
straining the muscles through very hard, intense exercise. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say you need to be on that higher end of that. But even still, if there is, in fact, an upper limit, which is, we'll say, around two grams per kilogram body weight, then I would say anything beyond that is now unnecessary. Right, but not necessarily detrimental. No, that's right. I would not say necessarily detrimental. In fact, I, I don't want to say that at all because it's not all of a sudden that you just start spilling all of that into glucose. You know, although I, I guess that probably would be the outcome, but even then you're just going to use the glucose for fuel or you're going to store it somehow. And it is hard to really overeat protein. I mean, you really have to make yourself in most instances <laughs> to that point where it's two, two grams per kilogram or more. You know, you're really getting someone's quite deliberately eating protein. So it's it's not someone's not going to accidentally do it in most cases. Yeah. And I found that it was it was definitely hard to do, you know, getting up to 135 grams. It's not that I had to push really hard, but I was so satiated already yeah. because protein is so satiating and so is so are healthy fats because they provide so many of those essential, you know, amino acids and fatty acids that we need. Now, what are some of the fields of research out there right now that are the most exciting to you? And you mentioned a little bit before we got started that you're working on on some new studies yourself. Yeah, so I guess I can really just most easily speak about what the work that we're doing. And a lot of the, the neatest stuff we're finding lately is, of course, with insulin and ketones. Um, we just published a paper. Mm -hmm. We just published a paper a few months ago where we found that insulin turns off brown fat. And so we talked about the metabolically active brown fat a little bit ago. Insulin turns it off. Insulin starts to, it basically tells brown fat to behave like white fat. In other words, hey, slow down your metabolic rate. Don't waste any more energy. Start to store it. What we're finding is that ketones have the opposite effect. That ketones, and I've mentioned this, uh, and we'll publish this hopefully around the end of the year because we're getting data from humans where we have humans in ketosis or not in ketosis coming to the lab and we measure metabolic rate and then we measure we pull a teeny piece of their belly fat out we do a fat biopsy and measure how active the mitochondria are from those from the fat tissue from that biopsy but what we're finding um, in our early results certainly from cell studies and from rodent studies is that ketones are telling white fat to behave more like brown fat. And so it's upping the metabolic rate in, in, in the white fat tissue. And, and we're also just about to, yeah, it is. We're just about to submit a manuscript for review to be published that where we look at the effects of ketones on muscle cells. And what we find, what we're finding in, uh, is that ketones not only reduce oxidative stress in muscle cells, but they also promote muscle cell viability. It's helping the cells live better, live longer, helping muscle cells live longer. And of course, that has potentially good ramifications or effects in someone who's aged or any of us and just wanting to keep or develop muscle mass. It seems like ketones may be helping that process happen where it's kind of defending the muscle cell. That That is just amazing. And another reason why I think ketones need to be reclassified as the fourth macronutrient, they just, yeah. they yeah. never cease to amaze with their anti-inflammatory properties. And I'm really excited about some of the research that you're doing and, and seeing some of those findings. So what, if you could put a billboard out there for everyone to see with regards to health and nutrition, what would it say? Yeah. So kind of what would be the simplest, most effective message that I'd want people to, <laughs> to, to take away from anything? It would be control carbohydrates, where that is just that that is step number one to a better diet that helps a body be healthier and better. It, it If someone needs to make that their first step, just controlling their carbohydrates. And I don't even mean, I don't mean to say you got to be low carb. Um, although I have a personal conviction that's the best way to do it. Some people just won't do that. And so I would just say control your carbs. And if you're not going to go low carb, then at least be smart about it and scrutinize what is the source of, of the, the glucose or the sugar that you're getting. And, and if it's a real food, if, that, if, if your carbohydrates are coming from real food, well, you will be so much better 
than if it's coming from a bag or a box with a barcode that sits on a shelf. I, I couldn't agree with that more. And I always emphasize real food keto. And I really love everything that you said about, you know, prioritizing protein. I think I'm going to have to start using that term because it is so important for people not to fear protein. And you want to be eating real food at all times. If you're going from food like products and then you're going to keto, but then you're just drinking coffee with oil in it all day instead of protein, like you said, yeah. I fully agree that starts to get Get weird and we don't want to we don't want to be weird we want to eat real food and make sure to get you know high quality proteins to nourish our bodies healthy fats and controlling carbs like you said so thank you so much for the work that you do and for coming on here and sharing some of your valuable knowledge and information with us we're definitely going to have to have you back on again because i feel like there's so much more i could ask you about you know the brown adipose tissue and and all of the research yeah. that you're working on so would love to have you back on again in the near future. Well, thanks, Vanessa. I had a great time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. I had such a fascinating discussion with Dr. Beekman. It was one of the most interesting deep dives I've been able to do on keto and understanding how insulin and glucagon work together and oppose each other. It is so, so interesting. I hope that you guys really enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And uh, we'll be sure to have Dr. Beekman back on when he is uh, able to share some of his new research findings. And I'm so thankful that we have people like him who dedicate their work and careers to furthering our knowledge and understanding of metabolic health and metabolic disease and conditions. It's so, so important for this research to be getting done. So I, we all owe him a tremendous amount of gratitude for spending his time and contributing so much to the dialogue, dialogue about health and how to better our own health. Next week's episode is super exciting. I have Leanne Vogel of Healthful Pursuit suit joining me. So be sure to keep your eyes and ears peeled for that one. We're going to have a great time as we did recently when I was on her podcast, episode 83, how to reach optimal ketosis. So be sure to go check that out if you haven't yet. And if you're interested in learning more about keto, I have a program called the 28 day ketogenic girl challenge. You can check it out at ketogenicgirl.com. It comes with 28 days of meal plans, and it also comes with my free support and coaching in our members group on Facebook and all the macros are figured out for you. Everything is done and calculated. So all you need to do is make the recipes, pick your favorite days, repeat them if you like, and join in all the fun that we have in our fantastic members group and community, which is the happiest place online, as I like to call it. So check that out. The 28 day ketogenic girl challenge at ketogenicgirl.com. So until next week, have a fat fueled weekend and I'll catch you guys next week. Oh,